Welcome back to the Limitless Potential Show. I'm your host, Vanessa Jane Patrick, and today we have a super exciting guest coming on the show live for you guys. I'm pumped for this one. I hope you guys are as well. We have the author, teacher, in um, enrollment activist, grounded spiritualist, Jeff Brown, joining us live today. We're going to cover some pretty deep topics. I feel like I'd love to spend the whole day diving into Jeff's wisdom, um, but got to respect his time. So um, we'll be diving into really deep stuff around um, the journey of self-creation, around maybe some higher consciousness love, um, and also grounded spirituality during chaotic times like we find ourselves in right now. So play along at home. We want to hear from you, drop some comments, um, and share this conversation with anybody that you feel could um, find value in it. Uh, and also, you know, we'll get to your comments and answer any questions as we can toward the end. So we'll be getting there. So let me just give you a quick introduction about Jeff. So you have, if you haven't heard of him and his work, you'll have a little bit more of an understanding about what he's all about. So a, a former criminal lawyer and psychotherapist, Jeff Brown is the author of six, six popular books, Soul Shaping, A Journey of Self-Creation, Ascending with Both Feet on the Ground, Love It Forward, An Uncommon Bond, Spiritual Graffiti, and Grounded Spirituality. And I believe he has another book coming out in November, which I'm sure he'll share with you guys as well. He is also the producer and primary journeyer in the award-winning spiritual documentary Carmageddon, which also stars Rom Das, uh, Sean Korn, David Life, Diva Pramal, and Mitten. After writing a series of inspirations for ABC's Good Morning America in 2010 and appearing on Fox News and dozens of radio shows, Jeff wrote the viral blog Apologies to the Divine Feminine from a Warrior in Transition, that autumn catapulting him to a greater degree of notoriety um, and particularly on social media, which is when I kind of came across Jeff's work, I think back in 2012. Um, so Jeff's new terms and short writings became a phenomenon some years ago and continue to be shared by seekers and growers worldwide. His quotes have been shared in social media by song, song stressors uh, Alanis Morissette and Fergie, Sophie Gregor uh, Trudeau, the wife of uh, the Canadian Prime Minister, and many other well-known figures. Most beautifully, they have touched and benefited millions of souls. This gratifies him deeply. He now understands that most of the challenges he faced and the millions of steps of overcoming were intended for this purpose, to support humanity in their efforts to embody all that they are, not to bypass their humanness, but to celebrate it not to find enlightenment independent of the self, but to find their awakening deep within it. Jeff is also the founder of Soul Shaping Institute and Enrealment Press, and he lives in Canada with his wife, Open Passages poet, Susan Freibort. So big introduction for an incredible soul. So let's, um, without further ado, let's get Jeff in front of you and uh, let's dive in and create some magic. How you doing, Jeff? Great to have you on the show. Let's do it. <laughs> I love it. I'm so, feeling. I'm. I'm feeling good today. How are you today? Feeling really good, and uh, leading me into a great question that I love to sh start with everybody, which is, what are you most grateful for in your life right now? Um, I think for this safe haven of a home that Susan and I have created um, and our economic benefits in the heart of a very grueling pandemic for so many people. Um, I'm thankful for this feeling of refuge that sweeps over me often um, at a time when many people can't find refuge anywhere. Mm, that's so beautiful and very heartfelt, I can tell. And 
I know we were just discussing um, just prior to going live, uh, like the million different things that I wanted to dive into uh, with you today. Um, I've been diving into your work um, really in depth for the last few months since we first got to connect. Um, and I've been, yeah, so many different angles, you know, from your soul shaping journey and your journey to discovering what it is that you do in this world and what creates real meaning and purpose for you. Um, to, you know, that uncommon bond and really diving into this whole new light of looking at relationships and, you know, creating something that's much more deep and intimate than what we tend to fall into in our surface level existence and the handballing of the responsibility of our happiness to others and all the way to that grounded spirituality and, you know, not, um, you know, succumbing to this kind of like you would call that patriarchal kind of spirituality where we have this guru and I got into your documentary come again and I've been spreading the word with that one because um, it is a pandemic in itself you know so as you can tell I had a billion different angles I wanted to take um, so I took a moment yep. and I really felt into this and I really looked at my own experience my own struggles with my own growth in my life and also the clients that I'm working with and the people that I get to engage with from across the globe. And basically it kind of came down yeah. to um, I wanted to really tap into what I feel you bring to the world in such a clear, real way uh, and kind of that wake-up call that I feel we could all do with, which is looking at the dissociation that we have um, with our bodies, with our emotions um, and, you know, with our ego, right, and with our thoughts and, and everything, and we kind of go into this way of um, being in the world, which is kind of perpetuating or what I feel it, it is perpetuating this these unhealed wounds and this non um, this idealistic way of living our lives, but really not really feeling the fulfillment and um, the embodiment of what we could be living. So it's a really long-winded question that I have for you, um, but it's really, I'd love for you to um, tap into what what you see in the world that people are missing in terms of this dissociation and what it's costing us. Oh, wow, right. Well, I mean, I think the first thing I would say is that I think we are primarily living more and more all the time in a dissociated world. And what I mean by that um, is that most of us, on one level or another, aren't really here. Mm -hmm. You know, we may be here on a cerebral level, or we may be here on a practical level, or we may be here on a survivalistic level, but... If I imagine sort of my vision of possibility for what it means to be present, presence for me is a whole being experience. So every aspect of us has a seat at the inclusivity table. Um, and that includes, but is not limited to, our unresolved emotional material in a world that desacralizes, makes less sacred the world of feeling and dishonors the truth of our traumatized experience all of us to one degree or another we already start off sort of shamed and shunned and discouraged from being genuine about what we feel on a deep level um, and as we've now entered into this overwhelming overstimulated media dominated media manipulated and that includes social media manipulated construct I feel like we've gotten farther and farther away from our bodies from our breath from our centeredness, from a spacious experience of the moment, and if we're not in our bodies, and if we're not really connected to the wide array of emotions that we've experienced, uh, we're not here. Um, and once we're not here, we're much more easily manipulated and maneuvered by all of these unconscionable corporate capitalistic constructs um, until we reach a stage where we no longer have the authority internally um, or the sense of self-possession to really be in this moment, to know who we are, to know what we feel, and to know what we want. And perhaps more importantly than all of that, to have this thing called common sense that used to exist in some real way and now is completely startling 
when we find it. Um, so now all of this was already happening, and then Trump happened, which intensified the level of dissociation worldwide, I believe. And then a pandemic comes, and you already have a whole ton of dissociated people, certainly a bunch of dissociated new cagers and patriarchal spiritualists who already are not connected to their feelings, their body, their selfhood, their unresolved material. And now we've gone to a whole new level of dissociative shit show as a result of the pandemic, pushing already dissociated people to the next level. If you're dissociated when this thing started, you're certainly not going to come into your body now. So that's why we're seeing so much in the way of what's called con or conspiracy spirituality, because most of those spiritual people were already, as I wrote in Grounded Spirituality, not here anyway. And they're certainly not going to get here when there's a threat that's confronting them on a very very deep level. So the greatest worry we have now in our world is dissociation, because how are we going to resolve, how are we going to put on our masks and figure out how to manage a very scary virus? And how are we going to deal with a climate change problem if we're being controlled and manipulated by all these unconscionable corporate structures? And if we're already so dissociated that we can't find our way back to our bodies and our centers, we got a problem. Totally, totally. And this has been a bit of my journey, right? Like, so I know I mentioned to you when we first got to connect, um, a big part of my journey, particularly over the last year, has been actually getting out of the realm of positive thinking and choosing your emotional state. And if you feel bad, like you get a choice and you can just dissociate from that, right? But it's not kind of worded that way. Um, and it kind of guilts you into if you don't feel any, if you feel anything less than perfect and grateful in every moment, then right. you get kind of stuck. And I went through probably um, six years of really that focus and developing that way of being and got to the point where I just had such overwhelming depth of sadness in me that I really had to go there. Like it was it was unshakable. Like I'm, I'm getting emotional just thinking into that and um, feeling into that. And that sadness overwhelmed me because I wasn't dealing with it or working through the healing or what, what that was generating. What was, what was my body alerting me to? What was going on in my past that I hadn't healed or acknowledged? And I had a very, and I'm still shaking this in my own world um, in all honesty, but this whole mindset of I never want to be a victim right? Like want to be the, the last thing I want to be is ever a victim. So it can perpetuate that. No, that's all good. And I find the lesson, but it's been a real journey and it continues to be for me to really even allow those emotions to come up and access them and put language to them and feel through them and acknowledge it and all of that stuff. So I know for somebody like me who is a constant lifelong long learner and I'm diving into this work every single day um, and I'm helping people along the journey, but, you know, I've got far to go and I'd love to hear from you um, what your advice would be to people who are really struggling making that shift or that tra that transition into the value of their emotions and the connection that they have to their bodies albeit that I know you mentioned during a time like this, you know, it's probably the last time people are going to be able to, you know, really go in there because there's so much trauma that, you know, the pandemic is kind of adding to that. Or what's your perspective on that? And what advice would you give to people to access more of their emotion and body? So let me first go back to the first thing you talked about, which is notions of positivity victimhood and so forth. So I am an expert at overcoming uh, victimization in my own experience. I am an expert. I was a salesman for years. I was goal-centered, pro progress-centered, not process-centered, uh, completing books, doing all the things, becoming a lawyer. Everything I did from where I came from required me to rely on positivity practices. So I understand that there's a place for them. But when we utilize those practices or some of those new age beliefs in a way that perpetually denies the truthfulness or veracity of our wounding, then we're, be 
creating a reality where we become like a bird with one wing. We can only fly in one particular direction, but we can never fly in another direction. And we can certainly never come back to Earth. So the art form of self-creation and managing this crazy world is to find a balance between appropriate and necessary moments of positive thinking and tools that are helpful in that regard, and knowing when it's time in their space and it's necessary to drop back in and do super deep work in terms of honoring your victimhood and doing uh, healing work around whatever your experiences have been. So my basic belief is that we have all been victims in our lives to varying degrees. We are all trauma survivors to varying degrees in this still unconscionable world, in a world where we've developed all kinds of skill sets, but the two most important skill sets, how to deal with our feelings and how to relate to each other, have still not been properly developed. Think about it. Thousands, millions of years of humanity and the two most important things, how to deal with our feelings and how to relate to each other, most of us are quite shitty at. Um, so I think really we've got to get better at it. And when I was leaning into the new new age, what I now call the new cage thinking, there was a period of time when I, I really didn't want to acknowledge my victimhood because it got me too trapped in the old material and I couldn't punch my way to a better reality. These techniques are wonderful if they help you to punch your way to a better reality. But when you get there, you now want to go back down the path and reclaim the unresolved material so it doesn't come back to haunt you. So you want to acknowledge your victimhood before you then move to the in the direction of no longer feeling like a victim. You can say you're not a victim all you want, but it doesn't mean you've done the emotional work to reach the stage where you no longer feel trapped in your victimhood. But the diminishment of victimhood, just like the denial of trauma, just like the shaming and shunning of our feelings, just like the emphasis on artificial bullshit forgiveness, even if you haven't reached a stage or don't want to reach a stage of forgiveness, these are all the many ways that we deny the truthfulness of the human experience and we control people. Because if you're not in your feelings and you're not in your center and you keep feeling ashamed of what you've experienced and what you've felt, you are completely manipulated by the patriarchy who doesn't want to deal with their feelings and doesn't want you to deal with your feelings. They can get away with murder. They can rip you off. The guru can sleep with everybody in the sangha. You're not allowed to judge. You're not allowed to be angry. You're not allowed to cry. You're not allowed to gossip. This is a game patriarchy has played forever to control the masses. So the way that we regain our sense of authority as individuals and a collective is we honor the truth of our feelings. The feeling is everything. The feel is for real. Um, and as we all know, when we stop feeling, when we become cerebral or automaton-esque like Eckhart Tolle, we start feeling robotic and we're no longer in the experience of the moment because we're not in our bodies and we're not anywhere at all. So the only way to it is through it, and that means you have to come back down into your body. Now, there are times when you can't do that. You have to survive. You're a refu Syrian refugee in a desert camp. This is not a time for you to go back and do deep process work around your early trauma. you got to put your boots on the ground, put your feet on the ground, and get to work to create a new reality. So the art form of self-creation is learning the difference between those moments when you can do the work and those moments when you need to put it off to the side consciously and just focus on building a better structure and foundation for your life. I was pretty good at that. I would build the structure, then I would go back and reclaim and do old work therapeutically. And once I felt resolved enough, integrated enough, and would plateau with it, or I was ready to let that go for the moment, I'd move back forward out into manifestation in my life. The ungrounded spiritual movement, the industry that is New Age sales, all of that is an industry. People have to understand they're being sold the easiest thing you can sell, which is dissociation, denial, angel cards, New Age thinking. Anybody who's in a traumatic experience wants to buy that. It's a drug like any other drug, and they need to understand that all of those new age concepts are a marketing construct that made somebody a fortune, okay? Um, but it doesn't mean that they're really ultimately a value you for you as a way of being. Short term, sure. Under certain circumstances, sure. Positivity is a wonderful thing to get you through all kinds of things. I don't need to watch Tony Robbins to figure that out. 
But when you lean too far into it, it becomes what I call perpetual positivity syndrome, where you're trapped inside of bullshit positivity and you don't even know what your real feelings are anymore. So it's a kind of a fine line and sometimes a very rough and coarse line. And you have to get in enough in touch with yourself emotionally, therapeutically, somatically to know the difference intuitively between when you're making a healthy conscious choice to lean towards new age thinking and when you're actually being played, manipulating, or utilizing it in a way that's actually taking you way too far away from reality. You got to figure that out for yourself. Wow, so beautifully put. And I think yeah. it really ties in with what's going on in the world. And I, I know you've you've been doing um, a lot of talking about this um, in the current sphere of what's going on around there's a lot of conspiracy theorists. And then it's almost like it's like black or white. It's like it's almost like you're either a conspiracy theorist and you question everything or you're succumbing and you're a sheep or whatever. And there's no, like, I feel like obviously you're bringing the, okay, how about we bring some balance and integrate these different parts? And we do question things, but we also, you know, um, do the right thing. So um, I wonder if you could share just a little bit, bit about that, about this more empowered perspective to have during this time without going all conspiracy theorist and without going all non-questioning whatsoever. Right. So I think it's, I think it's problematic because again, we're so dissociated and common sense is so hard to find experientially that trying to lead people back towards what I call and have written about as grounded spirituality is no easy feat, especially right now. So I'm not interested in agreeing with mainstream thinking to the extent that I can no longer think critically and rely on my own intuition about this virus. Um, I get that the media is a construct. I get that many of them, but not all of them, are completely manipulating humanity in order to bolster ad revenues. And the way they do that is by getting you anxious, nervous, and addicted to their news uh, I mean, that's the game. That's always been the game. Um, and that's an unconscionable game. The other side of the coin is the, you know, talking about all the sheeple who watch MSM, you know, while you pride yourself in being a unique, individuated, critical thinker who's the furthest thing from a sheeple, but has found the real truth in the rabbit holes that you spend your time inside of devouring on YouTube with pseudo bullshit experts with their own agendas, usually experts that were already defrocked by their by their profession, but you don't know that. And people who are making an enormous amount of money on ad revenues when every time you click their video and you don't know that. And you know, mo much of that, not not to say there aren't conspiracies, I doesn't take a genius to know there's conspiracies, but for me, the real question we need to ask ourselves is, what is it within us on a psycho-emotional level that is motivating us to take on one belief or another? And if we're unable to even acknowledge the existence of very seriously real data, like real data from real doctors or virologists. We need to ask ourselves, why do we have this subjective bias? What is it in our unresolved psychological material, because this is where this comes back to haunt us, is preventing us from looking at this in a balanced, fair-minded, and reasonable way. Um, so much of what's going, there's some, a lot of parts to this, but so many people in the ungrounded spiritual world, conspirituality world, they were led in the direction of new age thinking or patriarchal spirituality because they, on, on a very deep level, did not want to be here in their bodies. They had too much trauma, too much pain, either couldn't unpack it or won't unpack it. So they found all of these variously trans, pseudo transcendent, pseudo awakened, pseudo Eckhart Tollean, witness your pain body rather than engage it. Byron Katie bullshit, turn your story around stuff, because it made it easier to survive in this world and not have to do the deeper work in a superficialized world. So, of course, for those people, and also many of them with enormous amounts of unresolved work around authority from early life experience, trauma survivors, sexual trauma survivors, abusive parenting, neglectful parenting. So I fought back against my mother. So when the government says put on a mask to save lives, I don't have any issue with that because I already defended myself against the greatest government and tyrant of all, which was my mother. 
Um, but if you haven't done the work around your authoritarian experience, you are going to project it all and forget even politicization and the Americans with the patriots and the mass and government won't tell me what to do. That's a whole other piece. But if you have unresolved stuff around abuse and aggression and horrible traumatic experiences that have never been resolved, you're not going to be able to distinguish often between that unresolved material and how you're responding to a viral threat. Very simply. So you have millions and millions of people who are convinced that if they wear that mask, they are giving into those authority figures that they were forced to give into as children. And that's only one piece of this crazy puzzle. But sitting there yelling and screaming at them, like trying to yell at a Trumpian and explain to them why Trump is a fascist Nazi who needs to be in prison or sent on a rocket ship to the moon and never be seen again – it's a waste of time. They're in a completely different consciousness. You're not going to bridge to that consciousness. Um, for them to come to the place of even being able to consider without pushback what you're talking about would require them to do all kinds of work in this psycho-emotional body that they're not going to do in the heart of a pandemic. So there's not a lot you can do other than turning off the bullshit in every direction and trying to come back into your breath and into your body, and into this thing called common sense and intuition, and then respond to this experience that we're having from that place. And for some reason, that's not that hard for me. I don't, I don't, I don't believe what the media tells me, and I don't believe what the anti-media tells me. I believe what my body tells me. And if you're not enough in your body, then you you know that you're ripe for the picking from all kinds of manipulative mainstream and anti-mainstream constructs. And that's what happened. So now we have about 11 people who have common sense and about 9 billion that don't. So that's the world we live in now, dissociation everywhere. And that's why America is such a viral shit show now. And Canada isn't because we are more common sense oriented um, and less polarized on all kinds of different levels. But it's this, this thing is exposing... What I have when I wrote Grounded Spirituality, I already knew what was happening. I saw dissociation everywhere. More than half of North American adults on psychotropic medication just to get through the day or go to sleep. I mean, we have made a fucking mess of this amazing thing called capitalism. It's not conscionable. It's manipulated. It hasn't granted. Bernie Saunders is right. It hasn't granted opportunities. You know, I go down there and, and go to like McDonald's or Burger King. And there's people working there for 40 years at basically minimum wage, thinking that they've got it all together. Meanwhile, they're deprived of even basic health health care coverage. I mean, the whole thing is a terribly manipulated shit show um and now we're just seeing itself live itself felt out horribly everywhere yeah wow oh my gosh you just like unpack so much that was so deep to think about what's going on in the world right now with people's unhealed wounds with the authorities or the authoritarians in it's their everywhere. lives it's everywhere Vanessa. It's, it's everywhere it's yeah. it's, it's preventing, preventing people from coming back to basic common sense thinking even the simplest thing to say listen we don't have enough data yet on the virus so let's just lean in the direction of the recommended protections and if we find out they weren't useful or necessary we're all happy to take off the mask nobody's enjoying themselves but just to even come to that which has been my position all along listen we don't know enough we don't have enough data yet so i'm going to lean in the direction of caution and care until we eventually have more data even that alone pushes up against so many of these unresolved pieces. And, you know, because people are just so dissociated, they're much more easily manipulated, not just by the mainstream, but by the anti-mainstream. You know, this idea that you're not a sheeple if you buy into the anti-mainstream is so ridiculous because my experience of most of the people most entrenched in the anti-mainstream views are actually quite a bit lower intelligence and quite a bit more dissociated than many of the people who rely on sensible news. Read the New York Times, read the Washington Post. They don't read garbage. They read intelligent things written by intelligent people. The people who are utterly and absolutely opposed to them and call all of us sheeple, in my experience, really are not the sharpest tools in the shed um, and are far more dissociated, ironically, than everybody in the matrix. How ironic is that? Crazy. 
And and I so want to. So who's the crazy one? one? Uh, who knows, right? Yeah, like. <laughs> so I want to bring well, you well, back. I, well, yeah. I think I do. So I mean, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, this is the problem. There's no. We're we're in this postmodern world where everything is deconstructed. So nobody can say anything that we all basically agree on anymore. And this is, some would say, a wonderful and beautiful thing. All these ideas can percolate. We can have higher and deeper levels of inquiry, and then we'll come to a way more advanced, inclusive, and integrated truth. In fact, what's happening is it's just getting fucking stupider, right? Um, way stupider. Stupider than stupid. I mean, this stuff is stupider than stupid, you know? I mean, and we, and we can get into so many other pieces of this puzzle but the bottom line what whenever you see all the different threads of narrative around the deconstructing of all this pandemic all of it qa non all that stuff dissociation lives at the heart of almost all of this nonsense with that i want to take you back to something you mentioned on the fly with this conversation which was um quite awakening and quite it would have stunted a few people listening to this because i myself have dove deep into eckhart Toll, tolly's work and byron katie you know i've had her on the show right and um what you say though i it came up i just had this connection point because both the stories of Eckhart Tolle and uh, Byron Katie, they have very similar yeah, yeah, the same, stories. It's the same bullshit story. Yeah. The same bullshit story. Yeah, yeah I know. Their, their, their story, story was, was like they're, they're crazy, crazy and, and then like something happened one night and then they were enlightened. Now, now yeah. just, just think about how ridiculous that story is. It's, 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 sound, it's wonderful on a marketing level because, of course, everybody who's a little crazy wants to wake up one morning and they're enlightened. But it's not how it works. The material, the trauma, the craziness of our lives is embedded, embodied, somatized, cellular. It's inside of us. You want to move from crazy, let's say, whatever, to something healthier, more authentic, transformed more growthful you're going to have to engage in a long-term process there may be peak experience moments i have no problem with that but really the integration process of change and transformation on an organistic level takes a, or, a long time um it just doesn't now it sells product to claim that you were so when i watched tole i wrote about power i call his book the power of self-avoidance i but i i wrote re, power of now i read it i liked it it was like oh i tried that little automaton robotic thing that he does or whatever but i i couldn't feel my body i couldn't feel my heart i couldn't feel my feet i couldn't feel my ass because i was no longer really in my body um and you know i get the idea middle ground middle road watching your pain waving at it like it's he calls it a pain body, like he's talking about a Volkswagen car part or something. It's so ridiculous. And, but for me, his energy, after a while, I would listen to his voice and I'd start falling asleep. And I thought, this guy's not awake. This guy's asleep. I can't feel an ounce of energy coming off this guy. If that's awakened, I'm terrified for the future of humanity. If we're trying to take humanity towards that version of the new Earth, what I call the new Mars, we are in big fucking trouble because that is the heights, depths, and heart of what dissociation feels like. And his name isn't Eckhart, by the way. That's a delusion. His actual name is Ulrich Tolle. Just so we know, there's a whole story about why he decided to call himself Eckhart. So I looked a little deeper into it. Me, mostly in my body is the laboratory of my experience. And I began to feel that this was dangerous messaging dissociative messaging that sold product. Um, and I'm not interested in selling product if I'm not helping humanity. I get on a first level of awakening, you can play Byron's little game and Eckhart's little game, and it can help you to get a broader perspective, to understand there's another way of looking at things, to understand that there's a vaster consciousness more than the neurotic localized consciousness. And after that, they have no idea what to do to bring you back into your body. They're now taking you farther and farther away. And if you look 
at Katie's poster images, her memes, her words. I've posted many of them before, um, and I've posted contrasting perspectives. And you can do the same with Eckhart. You'll realize that really this is spiritual bypassing on a very high level. This is dissociative spirituality. This is exactly what patriarchal spirituality has been about forever. I wrote all about it and grounded. We need are people who know how to invite people to have a vast perspective. So if Eckhart didn't call it enlightened, didn't tell his bullshit story at the forward of the book about how he became enlightened one night, he was suicide, whatever that story. If he just said, listen, I'm a messed up guy with problems like everybody else. And I found a little, some tools, meditative tools. And Byron said, I got a few tools with story, turn around, different perspective that can help you. I got no problem with them. But when you start calling an enlightenment or awakening, I got a real problem with them. Um, because I think what we need is the alchemy. We need to have a move towards a vaster consciousness, a more unified perspective. And then we need to figure out, this is the great alchemy and the great challenge of the human experience to bring that back down into our localized story. Don't deny our story. Don't make fun of our story. Don't deny the veracity of our feelings. Don't deny our trauma. Don't spend our lives just denying the challenges of the human experience and pretending we're awakened. Forget that bullshit. Bring it on down, back into the body. Now knowing there's a vaster perspective that's part of this um, dialogue internally between localized self and universal self. And then let's figure out what the alchemy looks like of a human that's rooted in story, honoring of lineage and story, takes feelings seriously, and at the same time, has the capacity to integrate and move into a more expanded or unified perspective. Not one that floats above their humanness, but that comes directly from the ground upwards f through their humanness into a more expansive experience of the humanness. Not a denial of the humanness, but coming from and emanating from the humanness. And because I was trained in bioenergetics and Alexander Lowen was my therapist, I had a lived experience of my most unified experiences always happened after I went down into my body and cleared my emotions. I never found an experience of unity that felt real in Katie's work, in Tole's work. I just felt like I was leaving my body, getting that spacey eyed look, like with her eyes, those intense eyes, that whole thing with him, with that kind of, kind of deadened feeling. I was living it out and exploring it quite genuinely and felt like I was half human, part human, no longer human. But when I did it from my body, from my kishkas, from my guts, and from my feelings, and then cleared enough debris to come into a more naturally, honestly expansive feeling, I felt like I was now having a true spiritual experience, not one that was separate from my humanist, that, but that was indistinguishable from my humanist. And for me, that's the grounded spirituality we need right now. If we go in the direction of those things, we all these little techniques, these met these th these masters of self-avoidance that are masquerading as masters of awakening. If we go in their direction right now, we're in trouble because we're already in denial about climate change. We're already in denial about what we're doing to our planet. We're already in denial about this fucking virus. What we need to do is ground our spirituality in the wholeness and truth and kishkas of the human experience. Your story is your glory. And from that place, we can actually affect change and find our purpose path and our activism. Otherwise, we're just going to keep floating away like monks, meditating in the clouds while the water comes in from the great giant tsunami and drowns everybody. You want to pretend that's not real? Let's see what your last thought is before you drown in the oceans of a tsunami, that it is real. All of the trauma and trouble is real. So either we go into the heart of it and do something about it, or we keep floating it ab above it and actually watch everything get worse because that's what's happened. Oh, my gosh. This is amazing. And uh, I had a ton of different questions I want to take you in that direction, but I feel like I want to – because I want to be respectful of your time and I know we don't have too much longer left. So – I want to take a different angle with you with what we're talking about and go into the realm of intimate relationship. Um, now, your book, An Uncommon Bond, uh, it wasn't actually what I was expecting when I uh, started listening to it. I thought it was going to teach me, you know, that it wasn't going to be like a, um, a fictional story. Um, you know, I didn't know what it was going to be, but um, it was really moving 
to have this kind of way of looking at how you show up in your intimate relationship with yourself and your intimate relationship with another human being and <clears throat> and um, kind of from this perspective of it was like you're you're listening to the story of Lowen and your his journey and um, you can kind of take it in more, I believe, because it's not so confronting like this is what you're doing or not doing in relationship. But basically um, going through that journey and awakening to this deeper level of intimacy, I wanted to hear your perspective on like what you said earlier about our struggle to relate to others and obviously our dissociation from you know our bodies, but in particular around the abandonment wound and also our fear of intimacy. So like how can we um, how can we go into that? Like the, I feel personally that's like the scariest place to go, right? Like into that abandonment and the fear of intimacy, yeah. but that's where all the juiciness is. That's what we're here to go to the depths of. So right. I'd love to hear your perspective on that. Right. Well, I mean, I think that it flows from the conversation about dissociation. I mean, I remember in the experience that I had that inspired that book, The Real Lived Experience, My Uncommon Bond Experience, um, I remember a moment of incredible opening, like this expansive, um, profoundly vulnerable experience of the moment. I remember feeling both delighted by it and unbelievably terrified of it um, and I think that I was terrified of it and I think we're all terrified of it even those of us who dream about wanting it until it shows up and then we find various ways to run away from it because we are not trained in the art of deep feeling we are not most people can't even figure out who they are or what they're dealing with, with their own internalizations and their own unresolved material to think you're going to take somebody who's not fully clear, integrated and healed, throw them in a room with someone who for whatever reason brings up a lot of profound feeling for them. And that it's going to be an ecstatic joy ride for 40 years is idiotic um, because great love uncovers everything unlike itself. And as Lowen found out, in the relationship that I wrote about an uncommon bond, um, the, the deep opening that profound certain connections that just crack you open to the most profound experience of vulnerability inevitably crack you open to every shadowy experience you have yet to resolve every fear you have from early life or even your experience of past lives that have yet to be resolved and a whole pool of unresolved generational and ancestral trauma that's never been resolved around intimacy, closeness, what it's like to hold a space for another heart, a tender heart. So we grew up in a survivalist world where it's all everybody wanted to do was to learn how to armor themselves, never look back. You know, we had all the mantras from our families, don't look back. You know, just keep your keep your eyes on the prize. I mean, there's a million mantras and, and cliches that have been part of our lives that were about just getting through this life, right? They weren't about being authentic. They were about survivalism. So as we try to shift now from a survivalist construct relationally, which was duties and roles and gender identifications and all those things, as we get tired of that, because it doesn't even begin to encompass the brilliant possibilities of the human experience, now we're starting at the beginning of a bridge crossing towards what does it look like, first of all, to relate to the self authentically, you know, who am I really, not who am I supposed to be, not what puts food on the table, but who am I really? And how does who am I really interface with who Vanessa is really in a way that keeps the heart gate open and continues to grow in openness in a world that we don't haven't taught learned it. We we don't spend any time in school even learning about basic feeling processing. We don't learn anything about basic relational processing. We learn about like biology of sexuality, but not the emotionality of sexuality. So all of a sudden you have people having these profound love experiences with no tools, no techniques, and 
being so vulnerable and open and then having to go back out into the sort of edgy armored survivalistic marketplace and having to swing back and forth between being a lawyer in a courtroom and then having to fight it out like a machine and then going back into the most tender, vulnerable and open places. So it is a shit show of the heart, really, because we are not equipped and we have unrealistic. We've been sold by this unconscionable marketing construct, the Valentine's Day world, the love song world. We've been sold this completely bullshit version of reality where once you find the one you love, that's the end of the story. Well, no, it's the beginning of the story. That's not the end of the story. That's when the story really begins because now it's going to get real whether you like it or not. And where do we go? We have no love elders. We Spirituality is not going to help us with this because most of them are dissociated. Psychology is helpful because the shadow will emerge, but a lot of times they don't understand the sacred nature of relating, so that part's missing. So we're all kind of pioneering, all of us, so we need to not be so hard on ourselves because we're trying to figure this out there's a part of us that knows this deep soul thing is the human, the destiny of humanity, that love really is the portal to divinity, that it's it's not alone on a meditation cushion as the men who want to avoid feelings have been saying for centuries. It really is about what happens in the relational field, that we're not just here together to keep each, each other company. We are here together to show each other God. But we're just at the beginning, after thousands of millions of years, of even beginning to understand. Think about it. I was the first person to write a book called An Uncommon Bond about a term Jeannie Ochterberg and Jeannie Hine, Jeannie Hine created called An Uncommon Bond. Jeannie had written the book. She was my master's chair. I'd had the experience, and she just happened to be at the school, and she became my master's chair for this. But she had written a book about uncommon bonds. Uh, she was a well-known published author, um, and according to her, the publisher said, there's no way we can publish this book because the world's not ready for this book. So if we're not ready for this book, we're not ready for the experience either. And so you have a whole bunch of people out there who are wound mates calling themselves soulmates, not knowing how to go from wound mate to soulmate to whole mate, no idea. You have a bunch of ungrounded spiritualists claiming they found their twin flame because they're desperate to merge, but not necessarily healthily merge. Merge because they never merged properly because of their abandonment wound with their mother and father, and so now there's still little babies running around pretending they're adults trying to find something to merge with to get all those merging needs met that they never got when they were six months or 12 months or 18 months old. So it's just a shit show of we're not ready and yet we all beat ourselves up when it falls apart as though we're supposed to have done it better. How could we have done it better if no one's taught us even the first thing about what real, deep love experience is about? And if we're too dissociated and not even in our bodies, I remember the experience I had was pulling me into my body and it was like, and I was like a super smart Jewish mind guy. I was like, oh my God, like I'm not even familiar with this terrain. I mean, how am I going to do this right if I don't even know how to handle the way these feelings are moving through inside of the body itself? So it's not to say we should give up, but I think that we need to learn how to get here <laughs> as individuals before we're going to perfect the art of being here together. Oh, wow. And and that feels to me really true. Um, it's not, I haven't had the experience yet. I'm on that journey. And I just feel in my heart and my soul, like that is so important, you know, to, to be able to go deep in the realm of intimacy with other human beings. And yeah, and you're right. Like yeah. that's why I asked the question around this abandonment fear and this fear of intimacy that we have as this protection, you know, in this survivalistic world. And like it's that transcendence of that. But I think what you mentioned about us needing to be kinder to ourselves on this journey or this shit show, you know, of trying to figure yeah. it all out. And also the fact that there's yeah. really not that. Hard. Yeah, and there's not that many um, role models out there you know, that, that are really showing us, you know, what is possible in this realm. Like we don't, yeah. we don't see it. Um, we're just at the, we're we're just just at the, the, be the beginning. beginning. We're at the beginning. We're at the beginning. You know, an uncommon bond was, I guess, my attempt to paint a picture of possibility for humankind 
of what it could look like if we could get there. But I included in it, after the great heights they went to, and then all the shadowy material forced it to crash to Earth, and then they both had to go through their own processes, entirely independent of each other, for many years to reach the stage where they could reconnect and reattempt it with a greater shot, but no guarantee of success. I wanted to make it real. I wanted to show how high it goes and show how low it goes, because I don't think we're going to get there unless we're very reality-based about what the fuck is going on. Um, and if we keep, in the spiritual world, shaming and shunning psycho-emotional process as though that's substandard spiritually, we are doomed. You will never have a sustainable sacred love connection if you can't interface with the unresolved human shadow. Impossible. The greater the love, the greater the hate. The brighter the light, the brighter the shadow. It's all the same thing. You can't open the door. You can't play Eckhart's game. I did it in, in, in Grounded Spirituality when I deconstructed him. There's one paragraph where it's almost like he, he's like quite fine with your coming to joy and ecstasy through his process, but if you come to shadow and darkness, it's not okay. So you, you can't do it. Then you're like a bird with one wing. You're alive in one regard and not in another. If you're going to encounter great love, everything's coming to life, and you're going to have to deal with everything unlike life itself. Yeah. Oh, this is awesome. And I want to just touch on this because so many people are looking for the one, right? And, you know, <laughs> and they're looking for this idealistic person who ticks all the, ticks all the boxes. They're looking for the one before they're the one. They're looking for the one mm. and the one before they're already, mm. before they've become one. So how's that going to work, really? Exactly. So what what would you say? Because they, they've got good intentions, right? We can we can have good intentions. We're searching for this thing. Absolutely. And then we then we know, okay, well, if I want those things in a, in a partner, I know I need to embody those things. And we can go on this growth journey and it can be powerful. But I want to hear from you. Um, what would you say to those people out there who are really, they've got their list in order, right? And, um, but they're looking for this perfection of relationship instead of what should they be looking at? Perfection. <laughs> they, they should, should just, just be work. They should be, they should be the man and woman in the mirror and they should be continuing to excavate the truth of who they are and to heal whatever it is within them that's in the way of most embodied, integrated, clarified, present-centered consciousness. In other words, they should heal themselves and get to know themselves and become as intact and whole as they can as individuals. Um, and so that's therapeutic a therapeutic process because of in this world we're in you we still need healing and help um and i think that that should be the, always their focus and they should develop a strong uh, there's a reason why the uncommon bond experiences and i've defined them in the book in the dictionary at the back why they don't usually last when people are younger they're not developed enough they're not self-aware enough they're not individuated enough to merge with another person but historically older people 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s even, who, who encounter an uncommon bond have a much greater chance of lasting because they have a stronger sense of self. They can hold the experience and the space for the process more deeply and tenderly and solidly. Um, and they're more, there's more of a self to come home to so that they don't become dependent on the merger as the only way of experiencing reality. So the triad of co-creation, I call it, in both grounded spirituality and bond, which is that there's a self, so there's there's Vanessa, there's loving Vanessa, there's Jeff, loving Jeff, and then there's this world that we create together. So that's the triad of co-creation. You, me, the, th the thing. So if I don't got me together enough, or you don't got you together enough, we're not going to form a healthy uh, merge point of merger together. So you have to keep doing the one thing you can control because you can't control whether destiny will bring you that thing outside of you. Even if you're ready, it may not bring you. And even if you're not ready, it might bring you. So you, you have to work on the one thing you can control, which is you. And the more aligned you can get with a somatic psychotherapeutic approach rather than just talk-based therapy is helpful, usually in my experience, 
to get you to the stage where you're ready for great love, not just practical love, but something great. Because if you don't do prep work for great love, it's going to fall apart. Awesome. And can you do that, that prep work that is necessary? Um, can we do that? Or would you say that you have to do all this work on yourself to become ready to then invite somebody in? Or can you have somebody yeah. come into your life, right. but maybe right. you need to right. set a solid uh, agreement or something about this is a journey, right? Like this yeah. is a shit show going to be. Yeah. 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 What would you say? Great question. I, I, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I, I think for many of us, we have to do a certain amount of work so that we can recognize the love without running away and so we can give it a go without fleeing it. So I know the experience I had that I essentially wrote from for Bond, that last bit of therapeutic work I'd done with aloe and in bioenergetics prepared me to not run away when it came. Doesn't mean I was perfect, but I was ready enough to keep the door open. A year before, five years before, 10 years before, no chance. Um, and then once you reach a certain stage of readiness, and in some connections, you can do a lot of that work if it's a safe enough connection, if it's very charged and unsafe, it's hard to do the work. It really is. Um, but you know, then you reach a stage where you can do work within the connection that you can't do on your own. So it's, it's a fine line. In other words, you don't want to waste 20 good adult years doing no work on yourself, just trying to find the one that's not really usually going to work out very well. At some point, you're going to realize, I think there's something wrong. I think I need to do a little more work on moi before me, before I can really join with a healthy we. Um, and, and, and I think that's a mistake people make. They're so, and unresolved childhood material has to do with it, and abandonment wound stuff has to do with it. I just wrote a course about it, because a lot of times people are still in such a primal state that they're desperate for that fusion. And of course, they usually end up pushing everybody away because either they're too anxious or they're too avoidant or whatever their thing is. So you want to just get to work on you. And I'll tell you the one beautiful thing about it, as someone who's very sacred purpose driven as a writer now, is that that if you reach the stage where you're pretty good with you, you then have the benefit of being able to be alone and satisfied and not dependent on other to make your life something. And in that state, you're more likely to manifest something healthy and good for you. So everybody wins if they get to work on the self, you know? Um, yeah. So beautifully put. And it's another. Make yourself, more yeah. beautiful. Make make yourself, yourself so, so make yourself so beautiful that beautiful people will come and make yourself so beautiful that you love, you love what you see in the mirror so much that, you you don't even need it so much anymore because you found a way to self gratify and find your path and purpose. You know, totally. it's not about finding the one; it's about finding the path. You know, and if you find your path, then you're already happy, and anything else is a bonus. That's such a beautiful way to tie off our conversation because I know I've only I've wanted to go on that whole angle with you around sacred purpose maybe another time or when you get some a spare moment and we can I know you do a lot of work around this as well so we can point people towards all your work and I wondered if you could um, let people hey. know where they could um, get to know more of your work um, right now I'm just putting up on the screen just your website so people can go to jeffbrown.co. Um, but tell me about this uh, wo um, healing the wound um, course that you're doing because I'm signing up. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Right, right. <laughs> so, so, right. So, so there's, there's already four, four downloadable, downloadable audio courses on jeffbrown.co, uh, Sacred Feminine Rising, Inner Child Rising, Sacred Purpose, and Awakening Men. The Abandonment Wound Healing course should be up there in a few weeks. I'm very excited about it. It was a hard course to write because it's a hard subject for everybody. Even many therapists don't want to go near it. It's, I think it's the great mother wound and father wound of all wounds. Um, so that course will be up there. I'm doing some additional courses over the course of the next few months. So there should be about 10 courses up there by year's end. I have a school, Soul Shaping Institute, where my writing course is very popular. I'm doing one again in October. Um, and my, my next book, Articulations, a book of my popular quotes, 
I just got a wonderful endorsement from singer Leanne Rhymes for it. I was very happy about. So Articulations will be out in November. It's available on all the Amazons for pre-order. Um, and my book Grounded Spirituality and Uncommon Bond are still is still selling very well. And Grounded is really growing, especially right now because there's we're seeing really seeing tangibly. It's almost like it's horrible, but it's true. The timing of this book with what's now come and how at the time when I was writing it, people were going, Oh, with the new age stuff, it's not that dangerous. And now they're really understanding just how deeply dangerous it is now that it, the shit's at the fan worldwide. Um, so those books are available everywhere. Amazon. I did the audible, I did the audio recording for Blackstone and, um, and that's it. They can find me on Facebook, facebook.com slash soul shaping Instagram. I have an act. I'm getting more activated. I love Instagram. It's, it's softer, sweeter, and less contentious. Um, and, um, I think that's it. My film Carmageddon is at Carmageddon, the movie.com. It's insane. You need to wear a tinfoil hat when you watch to protect yourself, but it's, it's worth watching because it's really, I mean, it was, it's so much a part of my journey towards recognizing what this ungrounded, I found the perfect patriarchal, spiritual, ungrounded guy, Bhagavan Das, to live in my house to film with. And now I understand, as my work has developed, exactly why this was essential for me to understand what this was and to figure this out. And Yeah, it's quite a journey. Mm, absolutely. And I really want to thank you for all of the brilliant work that you've done and uh, how much it's impacted myself and my life and continues to do the same. And for all the clients that I, I've got a few clients right. here right now listening to this um, right now, and I, they all know your work because they're diving into it, particularly your tools with like the excavation meditation has been so powerful in the, yeah, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so I, yeah. I, I will say I'm, de I'm developing that into a teachable spiritual model in the next number of months as well. So thank you for reminding me to bring that into the world yeah that is wonderful and you know on a funnier well, note as well i want to thank you for um doing the reading of your books as well because personally i just find it so much better it's so much more connected when you hear the actual author reading the book so good work with that yeah. And, um, yeah, and I just wanted to quickly yeah. just share with you a couple of comments. Um, Bill says, thanks for all the soul smart wisdom. Uh, Sanford's finding truth. So is Linda. Um, Jared's loving this. And Tim says, powerful views on the path to being, relating and sacred purpose expressed clearly. And he's from Canada nice. as well. So nice. awesome, awesome, awesome. Um, I just God want to bless, acknowledge God you. Bless Canada. <laughs> Well, us Aussies like the Canadians as well. We kind of have this kind of, there's something going on there, some sort of connection. Um, but just want to thank you and acknowledge you and appreciate you yep. for the time that you've spent with all of us today. And uh, any last words that you had to share with any of, any person li listening right now? Wear a mask and don't vote for, for Donald, Donald Trump. Trump. <laughs> That's all I've got left to say. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Jeff. Much love to you and uh, hope to connect with you again Thanks, soon. Son. Bye, everyone. Thanks for being we here. We will for sure. Take, Take care. care. Awesome. Bye. Thanks so much, Jeff. Are, Are we, we off? off? Yeah, we're off. Yeah. We're good? We're good. Thank you so much. Connect again. Absolutely. Bye. Bye. <laughs>